below. In this video, we'll discuss tax-exempt organizations. Now, this video is meant to be an introduction. The subject of tax-exempt organizations is a very complex one, and we could have many, many discussions on different issues that relate to tax-exempt organizations. This video is just a basic overview and just brings light to some of the issues that you may see with respect to tax-exempt organizations. So the first issue is what exactly are the requirements needed for exempt status to be considered a tax-exempt organization under the federal tax law? So it's important to consider this like a checklist. And there's really a few different elements that are part of it. So the first element is that the organization must serve the common good. Now this can be broadly defined or can be narrowly defined depending on the type of organization. The organization must be a not-for-profit entity. Now it's important to understand that being a not-for-profit ent not -profit entity doesn't simply mean, okay, well you don't pay employees. You can still pay employees and you can still pay some employee employees quite a bit of money. For example, university employees, you might have a president of a university that might get paid millions of dollars, like the president of Harvard. So that's something to understand. But the idea is that the organization is not operated for a profit. That is the goal. The goal is more to serve the common good. So the next item is the net earnings of the entity do not benefit members of the organization. Well, one rule of thumb is that if an organization has owners or members that they're benefit financial benefits from then that's going to be obviously not eligible as a tax exempt organization. Now we're going to talk a little bit later about private foundations and how you might argue that certain people that benefit from the private foundations, maybe those that the private foundation is based around, they might be considered ones that benefit but there, so there's special rules for that. But the idea here is that we don't have shareholders or owners, again it's for the common good. Now the earnings can be devoted towards a specific cause, but they can't be, again, devoted to a specific member and a benefit is derived from that. Now the entity cannot in any way, um, I'm sorry, the entity cannot provide any type of uh, influence legislation or participate in political campaigns. Now it's important to understand that there's a little bit of an exception to this in terms of, okay, a little bit might be allowed, but this is just an overall general rule is that the entity is prohibited from attempting to influence legislation, participating in political campaigns, both local, federal, state level. All right, so what are the different types of exempt organizations? So this, um, what you see right here, these are what, the, what I call the big hitters, the ones that we usually think of when we think about what exactly is an exempt organization, what qualifies. And really, we're talking about federal and related agencies, even state agencies as well. And then also, the second line here, the religious, charitable, educational, scientific, literary organizations that are all related to that idea, that's really the, what we're really getting at. A lot of hospitals, churches, universities, they qualify under this category, and this is the big, the big group where we get a lot of our exempt organizations. Now, there's other types of exempt, exempt organizations out there like civil leagues, labor, agricultural, horticultural organizations like the 4-H club. And you can argue you know, that they have scientific as well, but th there's special carve-outs for these things. Business leagues, social and fraternal clubs and societies, cemeteries even, cemeteries, credit unions, group legal, uh, group legal service plans armed force member posts or organizations, so like Veteran of Foreign War, American Legion, those kind of things, they all fall in that group of exempt organizations. And again, there's even more. Qualified state tuition programs, cooperative hospital service organizations, they're all part of this specific carve-out of what exactly exempt organizations are. So what are the benefits that you get if you are considered a tax-exempt organization? Well, the first is that you're exempt from federal income tax, but you're also exempt from most state income tax, franchise, sales, and property taxes. Now, I'm not going to say that's foolproof because there might be some states that say, okay, well, certain organizations, yeah, you might be treated for federal purposes to be tax exempt, but not for our state. That could be something that happens, and I just you know want to bring light to that. So it's not foolproof. You might be subject to certain taxes 
in certain states or whatnot, but overall that is the case. Also, if you're an exempt organization, you can qualify for reduced postage rates. That's very interesting. Now, here is the big kicker, the big um, item. If you want to fund your organization and get various gifts, then as we know, charitable contribution deduction is a huge item when it comes to tax policy. It provides lots of benefit for those that actually contribute because they can potentially get a income tax deduction and if and when the state tax is, is operating also an estate tax deduction, which can be huge. If your organization qualifies for those individuals to get these deductions, it's huge benefit to your organization because it can provide, okay, that alone is a selling point for why somebody might want to contribute to your organization. Now, being a tax-exempt organization is not foolproof. As I mentioned earlier, it's not foolproof when you look at the state level, but it's also not foolproof at the federal level. There are certain associated transactions that possibly could implement your exempt status and they could completely remove your exempt status where you are going to be taxable or it's just certain transactions you know you might have your overall your overall transactions for the year are tax exempt but certain ones might be taxable so engaging a prohibited transaction we're going to talk about that in a moment that's mainly there's different types of ones but the big one is again that political influence being a feeder organization this basically has to do with an organization that um, think of it kind of like a subsidiary, if you will. It's not exactly a subsidiary, but it's an organization that's related to an exempt organization that does do a uh, business for profit, and, the, and, and those profits do roll into the exempt organization. Being a private foundation, the reason why that has special rules is because, as I mentioned earlier, private foundations, a lot of times, there's an argument that they do benefit specific members related to the private foundation. And then finally, my favorite topic is generating unrelated business taxable income. This is something that if you have unrelated business taxable income, it's unrelated to your purpose of your organization, it potentially can be taxed at um, federal tax rates. So let's talk about prohibited transactions. Now the big one, as I mentioned earlier, is that political influence. Now this may result in part or all of the organization's income being subject to federal income tax, forfeiture of exempt status, and an imposition of intermediate sanctions related to the insiders, which could have federal um, you know, criminal, criminal potential. So when we're looking at influencing legislation and influencing politics, the biggest item is obviously through lobbying costs. Various organizations, they will hire lobbyists to advocate on their behalf and try to influence various political parties. That's usually what we think of. So generally, organizations will lose their exempt status if they attempt to influence legislation or participate in political campaigns. Now, there's limited lobbying that can be deducted if the by 501c3 organizations, which those are the big ones. Those are the big types of organizations that we think of, like the educational, scientific, literary organizations, the big ones, religious organizations, if um, if they're, they, they actually file as a 501c3. Other organizations like fraternal organizations and some of the other ones we listed um, or that are listed, those ha don't, don't get the, the, any influencing of legislation. They, they just don't get that. So it really depends on the type of um, activity you are. But again, it's always best to try to be a 501c3 because you do have more leeway with these rules, but it's still very limited. Now, there is a ceiling that applies to the amount of allowable lobbying expenditures under the 501c3 election. Now, if you exceed it, again, the result will be you lose your tax-exempt status, which that's a, huge, that's a huge issue. And if you also lose your tax-exempt status, that also potentially, you know, you lose your 501c3 status. You're, you're talking about um, your, your constituents that are donating money to you. They potentially are going to be at issue in terms of getting their deduction. And that's huge. That could, that could potentially bring lawsuits. So that's a, huge, that's a huge deal. Now, lobbying expenditures are made for the purpose of influencing legislation by attempting to affect opinions of the general public or any segment thereof or communicating with any legislator or staff member or with any government official or staff member who may participate in the formulation of legislation. 
So the question becomes, what, exa what exactly is the extent of influencing legislation? Because what if you're just simply, you know, bringing um, a political uh, person, a legislator, to an event because they had some, um, they had some, um, they helped out with with it? Well, can, is that viewed as influencing legislation? And it really does depend on on the facts and circumstances. So I'm just bringing attention here. You gotta be you gotta be careful. Now there can be intermediate sanctions on the actual uh, members of the uh, organization, specifically managers. Now, it's, so it's very important. These sanctions can be fines, penalties. Again, criminal penalties can potentially be here. So feeder organizations. So we're going to talk about feeder organizations and unrelated business income. I want you to take uh, an example. So I teach at a university, and the university has a downtown campus. We're, we're located in a downtown. It's a thriving downtown that's growing significantly and every um, springtime every year this um, downtown has a huge race that goes through the streets of this downtown and this university um, we have you know we have parking and parking is a huge deal during this race because it brings tens of thousands of people to watch the race and it's a big race that people watch well when the race goes on as a faculty member, I get emails basically saying that, you know, I have very limited parking, even though I buy a parking permit. It's very interesting. And the reason is because the university, it sells parking passes or parking to the public. And it actually does this through a feeder organization, which makes a profit. Now, the university that I work for is a 501c3. It's a tax exempt organization, but it's not in the, it's not tax exempt with respect to parking, you know, selling parking passes for, you know, any events. That's not what it's, what it's for its purposes. Its purpose is for educational um, goals. So the question becomes that if the university did this without the feeder organization, would it be unrelated business taxable income? But that's not what's going on here, but I'm going to bring that, I'm going to bring that issue up later because this activity that the university does, does through a feeder organization. It does it through a feeder organization which that's what we have here on that's exactly what we have here. So a feeder organization carries on a trader business for the benefit of the exempt organization and remits its profits to the exempt organization. So the feeder organization, which um, for the university is a separate organization. It 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 rents out, well not rents, but it you know it it allows it, it you know it allows people to park in the parking lot of the university. And by doing this, it makes a ton of money. Makes tens of thousands of dollars in profits that, you know, just each day that it, it, that it does this, because this event goes over, um, goes over a weekend, all right? Makes tens of thousands of dollars each day, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars over the entire event for parking, because it, it's right next to the actual main area of the race. You know, so you can charge, you know, 50 to to $100 for a parking spot. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you'd be surprised. People don't want to walk. All right, fifty to hundred dollars, and you know we have we have a, quite a few parking spots. So the feeder organization is not a tax exempt organization. It, it, it's taxable on the profits because um, the profits that it's 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 providing over to the you know that roll into the university those go tax exempt at the university, but they get taxed at the feeder organization. So these are not exempt from federal tax, and it doesn't you know simply prevent taxation on this just because it's related it's associated with um, a tax exempt organization that's not the case now some income activities um, of the few organization are not subject to tax if they have special exceptions if the entity was doing it as unrelated business income so what i'm saying is in my example if the um university did not have the feed organization and it simply it simply had the parking situation where it charged for parking, which again is not related to education, and it was not considered unrelated business taxable income, then having it in a feeder would not be taxable as well. Okay, maybe they're doing it through a feeder because of there's some liability or some other reason. Okay, well, again, if you're doing it through a feeder and you didn't do it through a feeder and it was considered um, one of the exceptions, then it wouldn't be. It, then under the feeder, it's not taxable. That's the idea. And there's some exa ex uh, examples here. Rent income, trade or business where substantially all work is performed by volunteers, trade or business of selling goods. 
All right. So usually the feed organization is really done again for legal, you know, hire employees, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, pay people through the actual feed organization, that kind of stuff that's not related to um, the, the purpose of the tax exempt. So the next topic is private foundation status. And when you think of private foundation status, you can go online and search various private foundations. And usually what you find is a lot of very wealthy people, billionaires out there, will set up private foundations to help benefit society, whether it's raise scholarships or help, you know, with the arts or help with, um, with making, you know, uh, making our society a more green society, various things like that that are helping society. In general, private foundation is classified as such because it serves a more narrowly defined common good. It's not generally viewed as helping the public at large, but it can be viewed as helping, um, you know, some aspect of society. Now, such classifications can produce negative, uh, two negative cast, uh, tax consequences, or I'm sorry, two negative consequences overall. It can have adverse impact on the contributions received by the donee exempt organization and can result in the exempt organization um, losing its status, okay, or being taxed. So the idea here is you got, you know, you can potentially lose your exempt status if you got, if you're not careful, because again, private foundations have a more narrow focus, and those that donate money to the private foundation might not actually get the tax benefit, the deduction that they want. Now, there are some types of organizations that are never private foundations, and these are the big ones: churches, educational institutions, hospitals, medical research, charitable organizations receiving major, um, major portion from general public or U.S. Um, or the U.S. A state or political subdivision um, of a college university or gov and governmental units. Organizations that are broadly supported by general public, by government units, or by organizations described in um, number one above, and entities organized and operated exclusively for benefit of organizations described in one or two. So these are really the big areas we think of when we think of um, charitable causes. And as you can see, they're never going to be a private foundation. Private foundation, again, usually, it's not always the case, usually it's started by somebody, some wealthy person, or some wealthy group of individuals. They want to um, create an organization to help society, and by doing so, um, they have very sp um, specific rules regarding the private foundations. Now, there can be just um, general private foundations out there that just, you know, again, they're meant to help, uh, but they're more narrowly focused. That's the key. So, if you go back to our first slides, where we talked about what exactly a tax exempt status is? You can't have, um, a, a, you know, confer a benefit on a specific member. Um, so it's supposed to be it helps the general public. It doesn't provide provide benefit to one member. All right. So to meet the uh, broadly supported requirement number two above. So if you go back to our previous um, number two, where it says organizations that are broadly supported, to meet that, there's two tests, and both have to be met. The external support test which says that more than one-third of the organization's support normally must come from the three groups listed in number two, okay, which are um, general public, government units, or organizations described in number one, churches, educational institutions, et cetera, et cetera, as you can read there. And they come in the following forms, gifts, grants, contributions, membership fees, gross receipts for admission, sales, merchandise, um, however, such gross receipts from any person or government agency in excess of $5,000 or 1% um, are not counted. And then the other test is the internal test, which says that it limits the amount of support normally received from the following sources to one-third of organizations' uh, support, gross investment income, and unrelated business taxable income. So you can't have more than a third of your internal support coming from gross investment income, so income that comes off of interest, dividends, rent, royalties, or unrelated business taxable income. So the final thing we're going to talk about, um, the final topic, and then I do have, I do have mentioned um, you know, about filing later, which is, um, that's more of an administrative topic, but the final concept or substantive topic is the unrelated business income tax with respect to tax-exempt organizations. This is one of my favorite topics. This is a very interesting topic. So the idea is, if you have a tax exempt organization, right? Take the example earlier with the parking with you know my university, and you have this event, and they have a very easy opportunity to make some money there, right? What if they didn't have the feeder organization? So the university deals with providing classes for students, doing research, but it it's not its its purpose is not to rent out or 
provide parking at a price so people can go watch a sporting event of a race, right? That is not what it's meant to do. So the idea becomes if you have large organizations, the larger the tax exempt organizations, the more likely they're going to have so many different types of ways that they get revenue that they're going to have they're going to have income from sources that are not related to their purpose. And that's what the unrelated business income tax is meant to address. It say, "Hey, we're not we're not going to take away your tax exempt status. You simply have to file the form 990T." So 990T with respect to income that's not related to your purpose. Okay, now there's going to be some exceptions to that. But the tax to the entity on the unrelated business income is as if it was subject to the corporate income tax. All right? So we apply the corporate tax rates, whatever those are. You can look those up. Okay? The exempt organizations to which are applicable are all the 501C except federal agencies. So federal agencies are not subject to this. And it also applies to state colleges and universities. So aha, right? There's my university um, issue right there. I, you know, I teach at a university. It's a state university. And there you go. It's part of that. Okay. So the organization conducts a trader business. The trader business is not substantially related to the exempt purpose of the organization. So it's pretty easy in my, in my example. If, you're if you have a college and you have classes and research, there's going to be some things that, you know, that might seem a little far-fetched, but they're going to be considered related. But it's pretty easy to, to understand that when you have a university that deals with reaching and uh, with uh, reaching, teaching and research, right? That's my combination of, of teaching and research, reaching. Teaching and research, well, parking is not part of that. Parking is not, parking up, you know, at, 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 at a high rate for a, an event not related to the university, but an event related to another outside the university, that is not part of what, you know, the land is meant for, the, the parking is meant for students and faculty and visitors to park for, to go to class or to go to events. And yes, if you charge parking for that, that's fine, but you're not charging parking to go to outside events. That's separate. That is not related to the um, educational purpose. Okay, so you see that. So that's where you can you can you can. Um, that's an example of a difference where you might have something that is substantially related versus not substantially related, and it doesn't seem like that you know at first glance. The, so we're talking about parking. When the university gets parking, so I get you know I get charged. I'll just say I'll just estimate five hundred dollars a year for a parking pass for as a faculty member. Well, is that five hundred dollars? That income, does, when the university gets it, is that subject to unrelated business income tax? I would say no, because it's it's you 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 need parking. You have to operate that. It costs money to operate that. You have to hire um, parking enforcement. You know, security. Uh, you have to have lights. You have to pay um, utilities. You know, that's land. It's it's a, it's a high cost of land. Maybe you maybe they they lease the land. They have you know they have the land. And in downtown campus like mine, the land is expensive. So I would say that that $500 they get from me each year for my parking pass, I would say it's not considered unrelated business income tax. But when they charge $50 to park right across the street from this big race just to go to the race for the weekend, which by the way, there's no, there's no classes going on during this event. So I tell you, it's not part of it. That I would say is not substantially related and therefore it's considered unrelated business income tax. See the difference? So the trade or business is regularly carried on by the organization. So this happens every year. They've been doing this now for years since the university has been around and that event has been going on. It's been going on for years, for years. It hasn't been something that just, oh, okay, this has happened just one time. No, it's been going on every year, every spring this happens. Okay? So a trader business is broadly defined, includes uh, activity, production of income, sale of merchandise. To be related to the um, exempt purpose, the activity must be caus um, causally related and contribute importantly to the exempt purpose. So I pretty much, I think walking you through that example, that distinction of the normal parking versus the special event parking, I think that shows you like, okay, one, the normal parking is, okay, well, it's not exactly education, but it's related to it, right? It's substantially related to it. But the special event, when there's no classes going on, that's obviously not substantially related and that's considered unrelated business income tax. 
Substantially all work is performed by volunteers and substantially all merchandise being sold is received as gifts or contributions. That provides um, an exception to this. I will tell you that's not the case for my example. Um, they pay people to monitor these parking lots during this uh, time. Um, they pay them, you know, so that, that creates that issue of volunteers. And then um, it wasn't a gift or, it's not considered a gift or contribution. And sometimes I could, or th um, that can be an issue. Some people might say, oh yeah, pay us a gift or contribution. And, you know, it's $50 gift or contribution. That will, can really potentially, you know, you can get, you can get some issues with that because people don't want to get, you know, they want unrelated business income tax. So they just call it a gift or contribution. There's some exceptions um, for various, for 501c3 organizations, for state colleges and universities, the business is conducted primarily for the benefit of the organization's members, students, patients, officers, or employees. Um, so that's what you have to have. And ours, that's not the case. For most employee unions, trade business, there's special ones, snack bars, vending machines, food dispensing. The idea there is that's a perfect example. Let's say, you know, you're a university and you have um, like vending machines and stuff. Well, guess what? The university makes money off those vending machines or a snack bar. They make money off that because, you know, you can upcharge those items. But the idea is that the university needs to have food for their faculty, for their students, so that if they're going to be on campus for a long time studying and to make them do well, it, it helps the members. Well, in my example, it's not to help the members. They actually tell me I can't park on campus. If I do, I have to pay the $50, and I'm not paying $50 to go to this event, this race. So there's a special rule for $1,000. If the gross income is less than $1,000, you don't have to worry about the Form 990-T, which is where you report the money for the various transactions. That's with respect to one event, all right? One event, that specific event, okay? Or, I'm sorry, activity. It's not treated as unrelated um, trade or business if there's no arrangement or expectation of substantial benefits for payment other than use of its name, logo, or product lines in connection with activities, and the payment is not contingent on attendance, ratings, etc. So the idea there is there's no arrangement um, of substantial benefits going forward and whatnot. Bingo games are interesting. Bingos and uh, raffles are another way to think about bingos. So a lot of organizations do bingos and raffles to raise money. But what some people don't know is that, well, beyond tax, there's lots of state law issues you have to worry about. Because in some states, you can't, there's no gambling. For example, the state of Florida, you can't gamble. Other states you can gamble um, in. And um, that's something, that's an issue. But for tax purposes, if the game is legal under state law, state and local law, then it's not considered um, unrelated business taxable income. Or if it's the commercial game, bingo games are not allowed in the jurisdiction. Okay? Then it's not considered. So you need both of those. Sorry, I said or. It's and. You need both of those. So if um, if game is legal under state and local law, so bingo is allowed under state and local law, it's allowed in that state or local, and commercial bingo is not allowed. So the idea there is, well, you'd be competing against another commercial bingo, which produces money. So the idea there is you, can, you have income. You have income there. If you're distributing low-cost articles like pens, stamps, stickers, address labels, that's not going to be considered unrelated business taxable income. If that's what the issue is. Now, it's only assessed if the exempt organization regularly conducts the activity based on frequency, uh, continue, continuity, and the manner in which the activity is uh, pursued, and the activity produces unrelated business income. So in my example, again, this parking situation happens every year because the event happens every year. And again, the university makes quite a bit of money. And again, it's not related to the activities of the university. So now that we've gone through all these different issues, the question becomes, if you're a tax-exempt organization, what exactly do you have to file? Do you have to file anything? And yes, you do. Every year, you have to file a Form 990. Okay, you have to file a Form 990. And it's due the 15th day of the fifth month after year end. And that could change in the future. That's just based on um, today. By the way, that $1,000 number I mentioned earlier, that could change as well. So make sure you check that. That $1,000 that I said earlier, you might want to check that in the future, $1,000, right? That's important. That could change. 
thousand, you know, could be could go up in the future. So please check that provision. But it's a thousand dollars at today's date. So the form 990 is what we file, and we file it on the 15th day of the fifth month. You can have an extension. Extensions are allowed. A lot of um, these entities do file extensions. So what we're saying is the fifth day of the 15th, um, sorry, 15th day of the fifth month, sorry, reversed it there, is that if you're a calendar year, May 15th. But if you get an extension, November 15th. And that's the form 990 that we fill out. So additional returns that might be required to be filled out include the form 990T, which is the, um, that's what the unrelated business taxable income is. If at least $1,000 of gross income from the unrelated uh, trader business, so if it's under $1,000 from the activity for the year, you don't have to file it. But that's in combination with everything. That's in combination with all. And then the Form 4720 is the return of certain excise taxes on charities and other persons. That's a special one. Please take a look at that. Um, but I'm not going to get into that one. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is we all know that tax returns in general are not public information. Big, big companies don't just have their tax returns just on their website like they do with like their SEC and the 10K, okay? However, when it comes to tax-exempt organizations, they actually do make their information available. They actually do make their information available. There is a specific site called guidestar.org, www.guidestar.org, and that's what we're looking at right here. And you can use this site to actually look at various tax-exempt organizations, not-profit organizations, many that you know, right here, March of Dimes, Goodwill, Oxfam, Audubon. You can look at their actual Form 990s. So I want to take a look at one with you because I think it's very helpful to look at a Form 990 just in general to see some of these organizations. Now, I recommend you can create a free account. It's a it's a basic account. You just like premium accounts as well. You get more information. But create the create the... Um, the free account to take a look at some of this stuff and who knows you might need to look at this stuff later on down You know, maybe you, you're con you're interested in making a contribution You want to see how the money is being spent looking at the form 990 for each year will help you so I teach at the University of South Florida So let's take a look to see what kind of form 990s are out there so I always go by sort by gross receipts It's interesting, I put in University of South Florida, but we have all these other universities. Let's try with quotation marks. Okay, here we go. So the Florida Health Sciences Center, that's a combination of places. We have the, um, the Moffitt Cancer Center, that's associated with University of South Florida, University of Medical Service. But right here is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the University of South Florida Foundation. Okay, start, established 1960, statement of purpose, the USF Foundation is a private, not-for-profit corporation chartered pursuant to Florida law as a legal conduit for solicitation, acceptance, investment, and distribution of all private gifts made to the University of South Florida. So we're talking about any time the University of South Florida um, contacts you regarding donations. So I donate you know, quite a bit of money to uh, University of South Florida because I want you know, to better the university. It goes through this entity, all right? The USF Foundation promotes higher education in general and specifically encourages the advancement of teaching, research, and public service through private support, through private support of the university's academic and student development endeavors. So we go here, uh, again, if, you have, if you're logged in, show Form 990. We can get the most recent one, the 2015, and we're going to be looking at it right now. So this is the e-file graphic version of the 990. It's the same general format, but it's a little bit off what you might see in the IRS website. So we go through this. We have the address. It talks about gross receipts um, for the year. Talks about briefly describe the organization's mission and uh, or most significant activities. It gives prior year to current year contributions, grants, uh, revenues, uh, expenses for the year, all this stuff. It specifically says you know who filed the return. For this year, it's Cherry Beckert in, um, based out of North Carolina, that specific office. Uh, I was looking at a previous year, and um, it was by Ernst & Young. 
So the larger organ, you know, the larger tax exempt organizations are probably going to be done by the big four or mid market firm. It talks about its status. So it can be a 501c3 or 501c, and you fill in, you know, it's a fraternal various organization. Um, this is just a normal year because it doesn't have any special initial return, final return, all that stuff. All that information is presented here. So just the first page. So the next page, lots of information. And a lot, you know, every year usually they roll over this, this wording and stuff. The foundation serves the official legal conduit. We saw that on the page. By the way, this is like 60 to this is 70 pages, usually like 60 to 80 pages for the big, big entities. Um, lots of uh, schedules and stuff. So this is just informational stuff. You can look this up again online. Um, just this is informational questions. Um, okay, so we have some informational questions. This is just the, the main part of the 990 right here so far. Independent contractors involved. Again, you can get a lot of information from this. Statement of revenue, fundraising events, public broadcasting sponsorships, probably through their through the local um, the radio network, they, which you know most univer big universities have a NPR um, PBS type station grants other assistance to domestic organizations all this stuff good stuff balance sheet reconciliation of assets financial statements additional data so right here we can find um, information about the compensation structure for various for various individuals and by the way this might not be all the compensation so right here, we have a senior VP making about almost a million dollars. Then we have the president making uh, 536000 But again, this the president and this uh, senior VP, they might be getting more money from um, other, you know, state. This is just from this, uh, the foundation, this foundation. Okay. More people reported. Some people aren't reported on here, but they just have them listed. Maybe they get paid by the state only. Here's some people right here. Goes through and talks about everything. Again, you can look this information up, what their role is, executive vice president, um, lots of vice presidents on there and whatnot. Public charity status. So this is where it um, talks about 501c3 or another type of entity. So not all uh, taxes and organizations have to fill out all these, these schedules. This is a Schedule A, and if you're a public charity, you have to fill out um, this specific items that ask all sorts of things. Gifts, grants, all that stuff going on. For the last several years, it's not just, oh, this year. It could also be previous years as well. All right? That's a Schedule A. So lots of stuff going on here. Schedule C, political campaign and lobbying activities. So as I mentioned, if you have too much lobbying activities, you're going to lose your tax exempt status. And that's what you're reporting on every year. You're reporting that on the Schedule C of the Form 990. As you can see, this organization didn't have anything reported. If they did have anything reported, it was a minimal amount. Right here, they talk about 2740 was expended in general support of the University of South Florida Office of Government Relations. All that information can be made available, right? It's all here in this report. All right, but we don't really see anything else other than that. It's interesting. The, actually, the definition of lobbying is actually here. Limits on lobbying. Term expenditure means the amount paid or incurred. It's all specified here in the return. Schedule D, sub supplemental financial statements. All right, so that's just more financial statement information, which... Again, if you're looking to find information about a specific entity, a nonprofit entity, and um, you want to find out whether you're doing forensic accounting or you're doing something else, again, GuideStar is a great site to come to to find this information, especially if it's a larger one. Schedule F, Statement of Activities Outside the United States. See additional data. This says that um, there's some wire transfers going on from South Asia to USF. Europe as well, wire transfer. Some informational portions gives a little breakdown of why those amounts are received. The idea is that a tax exempt organization should be a domestic, you know, should have domestic ties. 
If it's going outside the U.S., it's like, oh, well, how is it benefiting our society? It's benefiting others. So you see that that's what that's all about. Schedule uh, G, supplemental information regarding fundraising or gaming. So annual giving, we have some type of um, fundraising activity here. We see the amount that's received is about 700, I'm sorry, seven, $300,000, 300 to 400,000 amount paid uh, to the organization to basically help with this event. So they are paid, an organization is paid to help. And we have other, um, you, have to, you have to list all this stuff out. You have to list out these items because, um, again, that can be a form of income. Grants and other assistance. So University of South Florida is a very large grant institution. So we get to see the grant amounts here. Schedule J compensation information. So again, we were looking at compensation earlier of our um, some of our key employees. And we have listed out right here. We've got some amounts and people. It's like 279,000 there. And then there's a list right here. Um, total of columns. So we have the senior vice president. Then we have the president. It's interesting. The president actually isn't the CEO. Notice that, right? Joel Momberg, according to this statement, is the CEO. Um, that's an interesting item there. Right? It's something, um, again, you wouldn't think that, but that's the case. Some universities, the president is the CEO. Schedule L, transactions with interested persons. Um, obviously, if there's any interested persons, we have to note those. So they have some SunTrust Bank, First Florida Integrity Bank. There must be some type of, you can read here um, that one of the chairmen's president and CEO for SunTrust Bank also serves as a member of the USF Foundation Board of Directors. Interesting, right? So you got to list that stuff out. It's basically just look at, looking at financial statements, right? You have a big financial statement, it's a 10K. Non-cash contributions, that's a Schedule M. Um, talks about everything there. Lots of um, works of art that were donated. That's a list of So if an individual donates more than just cash and they give art or property, you know, cars, golf carts to drive around campus, that has to be listed here on this statement. All right? Schedule O. So you notice that not all the schedules are here, right? It's only the schedules that are applicable to this entity. Okay, schedule, we go from Schedule M to O because Schedule N is not applicable to this entity. Schedule O is supplemental in, um, information. Just provide some supplemental information on this item. You can take a look at that. Uh, talks about, again, other things as well. So keep going. We're still on that Schedule O. Quite long, right? Schedule R, related organizations and unrelated partnerships. So it provides um, the relation. This is where if you have that feeder organization, you have something here, here listed because it have a relation to it. Right, you can take a look at that on your own. And that's really the end of this, um, of this, this uh, Form 990 for USF. Now again, remember the 990T is where you do unrelated business taxable income. Unfortunately, you need the premium account to get access to that. If you have the premium account, you can get access to the 990Ts which I would like to see that, but I just have the basic account. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude the video here. Hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found going through a tax return actually quite interesting. And what I recommend doing is going, you know, look at your university and uh, or a university um, related in your area and looking at their 990. It's interesting, all right? So I'll see you all in the next video.